Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Betsy Weber. I'm the Communications Director here at the Environmental Defense Center. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, Three Dirty and Risky Cat Canyon Oil Projects. Um, I'm going to turn it over here to our staff attorney, Tara Messing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today about three onshore oil projects in Cat Canyon currently undergoing review in Santa Barbara County. My name is Tara Messing and I'm a staff attorney at the Environmental Defense Center. As you know, EDC is a nonprofit environmental law firm that works to protect and enhance the local environment through education, advocacy, and legal action. I, along with my colleague, Alicia Rossler, a fabulous EDC attorney, will be talking to you today about these three projects. Alicia and I, along with EDC's Brian Troutwine, who is our environmental analyst and watershed program director, have been working on these projects since 2017. EDC's client on these cases is the Sierra Club Los Padres chapter, and we've also been working with an expert, Lawrence Hunt, a renowned local wildlife biologist. So here just shows the overview for the presentation today, and I will be speaking first about what is enhanced oil recovery as well as acidizing, and then I'll describe the three pending Cat Canyon oil projects. I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia to then talk about the environmental impacts of these projects, as well as provide you with a timeline for review and explanation of how you can take action. So what is enhanced oil recovery? Enhanced oil recovery is the process of increasing the amount of oil that can be recovered from an oil reservoir, usually by injecting a substance into an existing oil well to increase pressure and reduce the viscosity of the oil. All three projects propose to use enhanced oil recovery techniques, including cyclic steam injection, steam flooding, and acidizing which I will talk about later. Enhanced oil recovery is being used in Cat Canyon because after the, most of the easier to reach, high quality oil was extracted from the oil field, big oil companies left the area. So now we have this new technology that's allowing operators to inject high pressure steam deep into the earth to get thick tar-like oil that couldn't be reached before. Cyclic steam injection is one of the types of enhanced oil recovery and is used extensively in heavy oil re reservoirs and tar sands. Cyclic steaming consists of injecting steam into the wells for a period of time, usually a number of days. The steam is then allowed to soak in the wells for an additional period of time, again a number of days, before the wells are produced. While the first set of wells are soaking, steam injection moves to the next set of wells in the field. The process is repeated until all the wells in the field have been steamed after which the cycle is repeated on a periodic basis. Next, we'll talk about steam flooding, which involves the constant injection of steam into a set number of steam injection wells. The steam heats up the surrounding geologic reservoir and the heated oil is extracted from production wells in the immediate vicinity. The impacts from steam flooding differ from the impacts from cyclic steaming. For example, steam flooding cannot use the same production well for steaming, but instead requires a separate steam injector well. Also, more steam and thus water is needed for this method as compared to cyclic steaming. Now, there's been a lot of public interest regarding hydraulic fracturing, but little is known about its sister technique, acidizing. Acidizing is a highly toxic process that involves the injection of several toxic chemicals and acids into the well for the purpose of increasing production and or well maintenance. There are three different techniques for acidizing, acid maintenance, matrix acidization, and acid fracturing. You may not know that acidizing has a significantly higher concentration of chemicals than hydraulic fracturing fluid. Where chemicals make up only 0.5% of fracturing fluid, acidizing chemicals can make up 17% of the fluid for acid fracturing, 5 to 18% of the fluid for matrix acidizing, or 6% of the fluid for acid maintenance. All three projects propose to use acid for well maintenance purposes. Acid maintenance is a procedure regularly used to remove deposits formed on well surfaces, also known as scale. In acid maintenance, operators inject acid solutions at specific locations in the well bore to react with the scale. The scale is thus cleaned off the, well surface, the surface of the well bore and equipment without any acid penetrating into the formation, unlike with acid fracturing and matrix acidization. Many of the acidizing chemicals are classified and regulated as hazardous air pollutants, these include, but are not limited to, methanol, hydrofluoric acid, formaldehyde, toluene, and others. 
All three projects propose to use horizontal drilling to increase production. Horizontal drilling allows operators to drill multiple wells from a single pad. This type of drilling is depicted in the graphic and is defined as a well drilled in a manner to reach an angle of 90 degrees, as compared to a vertical well drilled straight down. In practice, the horizontal section of most horizontal wells vary by several degrees. Due to California's geology, drilling for oil and gas yields far more water than oil. In 2014, for example, of the 205 million barrels of oil produced in California, more than 3.3 billion barrels of water was extracted. Water that is produced from formations during oil and gas production may be disposed of into underground aquifers or reused as steam. Water that is re-injected underground for disposal is regulated under EPA's Class II UIC program. The increase in wastewater associated with oil and gas production today is due in large part to the development of oil and gas from unconventional formations through enhanced oil recovery. Due to the geologic differences between the formations for conventional versus enhanced oil extraction, the amount of water used and wastewater produced tends to be much greater with enhanced oil extraction. Operators are allowed to inject their dirty and toxic wastewater generated during production directly into underground sources of water for disposal purposes under what is known as an aquifer exemption. Under EPA's UIC regulations, aquifers that meet certain criteria may be exempt to allow underground sources of water to be used by energy companies for disposal purposes or oil extraction. An aquifer exemption currently exists in Cat Canyon, but ERA, Petrarock, ERG, along with BE Conway Energy, have jointly applied to expand the areas in which they can dump their wastewater. ERG estimates in its EIR that 50,000 barrels of produced water per day will be injected into underground aquifers. That amounts to over 18 million barrels of contaminated wastewater being pumped underground each year for this project alone. Now we'll look at the three onshore oil projects proposed in Cat Canyon. As discussed previously, these are not conventional oil projects, but rather thermally enhanced oil recovery projects. All three applicants are Kern County-based operators coming to Santa Barbara with proposals that would triple Santa Barbara County's current oil production. First, ERG. So ERG is proposing 233 new thermally, thermally enhanced oil wells, 102 well and equipment pads, four steam generators, a new 3.5 mile natural gas pipeline, and ERG will use its existing network of disposal wells to inject over 18 million barrels of contaminated produced wastewater annually, in addition to existing operations. Also, the comp company is currently in bankruptcy proceedings and we're directed to sell their assets. So another complicating factor of this project is that we do not know who the operator will be. What we do know is that ERG owes the county over $14 million in taxes. The company has disputed and appealed its property tax bill to the county and also asked the bankruptcy court to reduce its tax liability, which the court denied. ARIS project in involves 296 oil injection and water wells, 72 well pads, six steam generators, and a new 14 mile natural gas pipeline. Like the other projects, light crude oil would be imported to the project site for blending with the heavy viscous produced oil extracted from the Cat Canyon oil field. However, ERA plans to truck light crude sources from its producing complex in Bakersfield to the project site, which is approximately 134 miles one way. Petrox project involves 231 oil injection and water wells, 29 well pads, five steam generators, as well as a new 2.7 mile dry gas line. So substantial quantities of freshwater are required during project construction and operations for all three projects such as for dust control, grading, compaction, fire protection, landscape irrigation, and domestic purposes. A lot of fresh water is also used during well drilling. Fresh water is needed during drilling because the brine water is not suitable for the drilling muds. ERA estimates that the project will need over 21,000 gallons of fresh water annually during project operations. And for ERG's construction activities, the project will require over 14,000 gallons of fresh water each year. This slide shows a photo of a tanker truck driving by ERG's Cat Canyon properties. Trucks spill more oil and gas than both rail and pipeline and have a six time fatality rate. Collectively, over 600 trucks per day will be added to local roads like Dominion Road, Fox and Canyon Road, Palmer Road, and Cat Canyon Road. During the construction of the natural gas pipeline for ARIS projects, 
trucks will travel directly through the community of Orcutt and temporary road closures are expected. Construction traffic would be generated by the projects during well development and other construction activities. Truck trips would include those delivering materials and equipment and for watering for dust suppression. During operations, oil tanker truck traffic on local roads will increase significantly as a direct result of these three projects. This is because, as I mentioned before, all three projects will involve oil tanker trucks bringing in light crude oil to blend with the extracted heavy crude, and then after the oil is extracted, oil tanker trucks will transport the crude back out for processing. The county's EIRs have more detailed information about truck routes if you are interested in learning whether these trucks will be on roads near your family and friends. During construction, substantial and unavoidable noise will result from the use of heavy equipment for site preparation and grading, well drilling, installation of new well equipment, paving, and other proposed oil production facilities, such as the installation of new equipment and the construction of new pipelines. During the years of operations, noise will be generated by well pad equipment operations, such as well pump jacks, maintenance of new wells for work over drilling, and site maintenance, as well as noise generated by the trucking of crude oil from the oil field to the refineries. ERG's proposed project will grade and pave over 91 acres, and that's just four roads. Even more grading and paving will be necessary for well pads, equipment areas, production facilities, and the pipeline. However, to date, ERA's project is the most significant proposal in terms of grading, ground disturbance, and habitat destruction. 305 acres will be disturbed. There will be 1,500 oak trees removed. Grading for the project is for the central processing facility, the steam generation site, the production group station, well pads, roads, entrances, pipe corridors, building sites, laydown areas, 16 stormwater detention basins, and a new beneficial reuse site. Petrox project development footprint would be equivalent to approximately 28 acres. And currently, the 4.5 mile, sorry, 4.5 acre tank battery pad is undergoing soil remediation by the previous operator. Approximately 30,380 cubic yards of cut and 36,120 cubic yards of fill is required to level the pad and excavate acres areas beneath the, beneath the tanks and structures. Finally, these projects all involve the construction of new pipelines. So ERG has this existing four inch natural gas fuel pipeline, which extends underground about 3.5 miles from an existing Southern California gas company vault around Highway 135. This existing gas pipeline provides supplemental natural gas to operate oil field equipment if and when there's insufficient field gas. But as part of the project, a new eight inch diameter pipeline would be installed and would be continuously used to supplement the gas necessary to fulfill fuel gas needs for the steam generators. The new pipeline would essentially follow the same route as the existing line, except the line would be located primarily within vineyard roadways, whereas the existing line crosses established vineyards. ERG is proposing to leave the existing pipeline in place to serve as an emergency backup when the new line is out of service for maintenance or repair. ERA's project includes a new 14 mile, eight inch natural gas pipeline to deliver natural gas fuel to meet the project's need for steam generation. The proposed natural gas pipeline and associated facilities would originate at the existing Southern California gas line and would terminate at ERA's proposed central processing facility located in the southwest corner of the project site. The pipeline route would in part traverse through the community of Orcutt, which places a serious risk to public health and safety. Finally, Petrock proposes to build a new 2.7 mile dry gas line from the Southern California gas main line along Fox and Canyon Road to the existing tank battery, which is currently undergoing soil remediation. This line is actually going to be installed above ground and a future connection at Fox and Canyon Road is also proposed during the development phase of the project. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to my colleague, Alicia Rossler, who is going to talk about how 760 new wells will affect you. And please bear with us while we transition our screens. Hi, good afternoon. This is Alicia Rossler. Thank you, Tara, for providing such a thorough description of these three immense oil projects proposed for our community. Since CDC and our clients, SB Can and Sierra Club, defeated PCC's project in 2016, we've learned that these projects have a much larger scope and impact on the community 
than what has been previously disclosed in the environmental review process. Today, I'm going to continue the second phase of our presentation and discuss how are these how these projects will impact our community. As you can see, here's an overview of different impact areas that I will address in more details to follow. Some of the areas that these projects have a very significant impact on would be our local groundwater resources. In addition to that, they will threaten our air quality, our water quality, and contaminate our local aquifers putting our safety at risk by adding oil tankers and trucks on local roads. And then lastly, we'll talk about biodiversity and the extensive native habitat destruction that follows these projects. Pardon me. Um, first, I'd like to discuss the increased air pollution impacts. So as Tara went into a little bit of detail, Cat Canyon oil, um, Cat Canyon oil field has already been um, through much conventional oil drilling over the years for almost 100 years. And what's left now is a highly viscous oil that's having a very thick consistency, somewhere stuck between a solid and a liquid. This affects the amount of energy that's required to extract the oil and directly impacts uh, our air quality through increased air pollution. So extracting oil by these specific inject injection methods requires a significant amount of energy. When factoring in thermal production methods and life cycle, Cat Canyon oil is estimated to be among the top 10% of carbon intense operations in the world. And this in part is due to the steam generators it's required to heat the steam and inject the oil, inject it into the ground to actually release and loosen the oil quantities. These steam generators emit um, ozone precursors such as nitrous oxides and ROCs um, that would require a significant amount of emission reduction credits and can be very hard if not impossible for these projects to actually obtain locally. In addition to that, um, these, one of the side effects from all the construction of these projects would be significant particulate matter. Um, our area is already not in attainment with state standards for particulate matter, and this is that heavy fugitive dust um, that you see kicked up during years of construction. And several of these projects, for example, ERA's uh, project, estimate construction lasting over 30 years. And when you look at the possibility of having three projects simultaneously being constructed, and operating for the next 30 to 40 years, the amount of fugitive dust is significant. Um, so additional sources of emission include tanker trucks, water trucks to suppress the dust, additional uh, water trucks required for fire suppression, and there's a significant amount of heavy trucks that would be transporting hazardous waste to and from the site as well. The next area I'd like to talk about is our drain on freshwater resources. There's a lot of misleading information about how much fresh water these new oil projects will consume. For example, you see many of these operators will put out public statements and in the environmental review documents stating no fresh water will be utilized for steaming. However, what they fail to mention is the several million gallons of fresh water required annually for each project for drilling. And if you recall, the purpose of these projects are to drill for oil. So that drilling occurs throughout the construction phase as well as into the operations phase. Um, and just to give you a few numbers to chew on, for example, ARA's project estimates are over 8 million gallons a year. Um, Petrarock would require over um, 7 million gallons a year. Um, now this type, of this type of water consumption can compete with local businesses and farmers um, which is a really significant factor when you're looking at um, the state of drought that we've been in and a declining aquifer. The basin's been in decline for years. It is adjudicated at the time at this time. However, um, there are a lot of estimates that it would be actually approaching overdraft in the near future. Next, I want to talk about how these types of thermal recovery projects actually threaten our ground, our groundwater. Well, there's several different mechanisms um, about how our groundwater can be impacted. Um, as 
we mentioned earlier, Cat Canyon oil field overlays the Santa Maria groundwater basin, which is the sole source of drinking water for several of the North County communities that surround this particular oil field. Um, and there is a high risk from contamination into that drinking water and aquifer when you look at all the amount of oil, chemicals, injected wastewater that could potentially enter the fresh water. So one of the ways that that can happen is through geologic instability. So the injection of steam, um, as Tara mentioned, um, and directional drilling, the horizontal drilling, um, can decrease the geologic stability of the underground formation and then potentially cause well failures or underground spills leading to potential contamination of the aquifer. Another pathway for contamination to the aquifer would be the imbalance of fluid extraction versus injection. Um, as Tara also discussed, these projects are not only injecting steam and extracting oil, they also involve injecting a large amount of wastewater into another formation. So what happens is you're taking water out of one formation and then you're putting it into another underground formation, which creates this imbalance. And what you can get, you can get an imbalance of underground pressure and that, and that can cause um, land subsidence. Um, according to the county's 2011 groundwater report, depression of the water table occurs in areas where there has been documented heavy pumping. Um, this was in the Santa Maria groundwater basin. Another pathway of contamination would be upward or horizontal migration of oil and chemicals during project operations. So the fresh water here is located between zero to 1500 feet in the Paso Robles fam, um, formation and the Cariaga formations. Um, however, the injection of steam is much lower and what can occur is a sort of upward or horizontal migration that then causes contaminants to breach into that freshwater zone. And then you can get things like oil, gas, acids, um, highly toxic drilling muds that can pollute our groundwater resources. Uh, another mechanism or pathway um, of concern is surface spills. Um, it's quite easy for these pro um, projects and there has been a lot of history in Cat Can in particular where they breach containment and can reach waterways or they percolate to an underground freshwater um, aquifer. For example, between 2011 and 2015, ERG was responsible for 21 oil spills that at least released over 20,000 gallons of crude and was one of the top three operators with the highest number of oil spills and volume of oil spilled in the county. Uh, another, another pathway of, and concern is the acidizing treatments that Tara had mentioned that contain a very high concentration of fracking chemicals. And although acid maintenance could use a, a lower concentration of acid in the injection fluid, um, it is still used with such frequency that is a large concern if there are any accidents or spills. Um, and this acidizing chemicals would be injected into the underground aquifer with the wastewater disposal as well. Um, and some of the health effects from these acid chemicals, they're, they're very high, contain very high reproductive toxin loads from xylene, ethyl benzene, and toluene. Um, and the high neurotoxin load is primarily from xylene and hydrofluoric. Crystalline silica, ethyl benzene, and nitrolytic acid are main contributing car carcinogens. Um, and there is very high mammalian toxicity loads. So, as these chemicals accumulate underground and if they breach into our water and you have um, residents that are potentially being impacted through surface water by playing in creeks or streams, or if it breaches into the drinking water aquifer, you can get bioaccumulation of toxicities that are gonna last for generations. And some of this is documented in um, data that's been collated by the state of California's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. They developed a rigorous system to document existing pollution and threats known as the Cal Enviro screen. The Cal Enviro screen identifies California communities by census tract that are disproportionately burdened and vulnerable to, and vulnerable to multiple sources of pollution. Um, and this has been particularly enlightening for the Cat Canyon area and those communities when we looked at this data. Um, for example, the Cal Enviro screen, the state of California designates the areas surrounding Cat Canyon's oil field as being in the 100th percentile for groundwater threats. 
This means that 100% of the census tracts in the state of California have lower threats to groundwater than these communities surrounding Cat Canyon. Um, this is the existing state before we even approve these projects. This indicator is calculated by considering number of groundwater cleanups, um, the weight of each site, and the distance between a census tract and other groundwater cleanup areas. This data confirms that the Cat, Canyons, um, the Cat Canyon contains and is near over 64 groundwater cleanup sites. And this particularly heightens the concerns about the project's groundwater impacts and something we need to consider if we're looking at approving these projects. Yep, pardon me. Um, okay, next. Um, another thing we wanted to address in more detail was the wastewater disposal well. Um, as I mentioned, several of the projects are relying on existing wastewater disposal wells, and some of them will actually um, be relying on new wastewater disposal wells. So um, Santa Barbara, and particularly county in general, is alarming when we looked into this and in that they are second only to current in the number of these wastewater disposal wells and they are completely out of proportion with the amount of oil drilling here. Um, so approving these three new projects would just add millions and millions of wastewater into our underground aquifer, contaminating it um, potentially and leaving it unavailable for future generations. So um, for example, on January 17th, 2017, Dogger wrote a letter to EPA that identified 475 disposal wells across the state that were injecting into underground aquifers that were not exempted to the Safe Water Drinking Act. And as Tara mentioned earlier, Cat Canyon had, um, did have some of those wastewater wells. So there is a history here of illegal injections into the aquifer as well. Next, I'm going to address some of the tanker. Um, hundreds of tanker trucks uh, will be, will put motorists, bikers, pedestrians at risk of deadly collisions on local roads. This is a significant and alarming number of tanker trucks. Um, tanker trucks are required to import and export crude from Kern County. These are all Kern County oil companies. They're all based in Kern County and they're looking at Santa Barbara County as sort of their next destination for large oil exploitation. And a lot of the traffic will be coming back and forth between Kern County and Santa Barbara County. Uh, this is significant. Um, if you recall anything in the news of recent years, there's been a significant number of documented fuel tanker trucks um, sliding into SUVs and families um, as recently as just last summer, a fuel tanker truck crashed into an SUV, killing a nine-year-old boy and two other people. Um, this was then on September 30th, 2018, a tanker truck toppled over on Highway 1 west of Orkut. Um, there's been a significant number of trucks already. And then when you look at these three pro projects, adding an additional 600, it's hard to even fathom how many trucks are going to be going by when you average it out every minute. Um, and the other impact on that is, is there is a significant fiscal burden that the community will have to share in terms of the destruction on local roads. So there have been several studies about that quantify the amount of uh, road decay and destruction from one of these heavy trucks compared to a passenger vehicle. So damage caused by one heavy, heavy truck is equivalent to 18,000 passenger vehicles. Um, and this is significant when you factor that out and you take 600 trucks a day. And if each one of those trucks equals 18,000 passenger trucks and passenger vehicles and how much damage that's gonna be doing to local roads. And one of the, one of the few last issues we'll address is the extensive habitat destruction. Although this is an oil field and it has been developed for several years, um, there has been a significant amount of habitat that remains. It's a very biologically diverse area that supports a broad mosaic of rare native species and habitats. And as Tara mentioned, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of acres that will be just completely destroyed, paved over and graded. 
This completely alters the land, existing landscape. This is an area where there are cyclists, wineries, there's a vibrant tourist community that um, support, this whole area supports. And it's significant to think about how much habitat will just be literally bulldozed over and replaced with these oil wells, structures, steam generators. Um, and some of the, pro some of the species, um, as I mentioned before, are the Western Spadefoot, the California Tiger Salamander, and the California Red-Legged Frog, just a handful of endangered and protected species. This is a picture of the Western Spadefoot Toad for anyone who's been fortunate enough um, to find one of these. Um, mentions that there are over 65 special status wildlife species that have a potential to, occur, potential to occur just on ERG's Cat Canyon project site alone. Um, and that is, that's just alarming um, and something that we need to be able to try to protect that with the oil, um, oil production, the noise, the light impacts, the trucks, um, you know, one of the most significant um, stressors on any of these wildlife species is going to be the, the night and day truck traffic that will be going through, which is one of the main ways that um, threats to California tiger salamander. Here's one of the little critters on site too, the American badger. And then, um, as I just mentioned, the noise impacts. Now, anyone who lives near these project sites already in the Cat Canyon oil field has already been um, fairly disturbed by just the existing level of noise. Um, now you can triple that. The noise, um, actually the environmental impact analysis for two of the projects already has already elevated um, well drilling noise to a class one impact, which is a significant impact um, that can't be mitigated below significance. It's unfortunate the location of the um, field and how close it actually is to residents, children, and an elementary school that are located as close as 0.7 miles from the project site. These noise impacts can pose a serious threat to a child's physical and physiological health and impact their capacity to learn. Um, not to mention the impact to tourist businesses such as wineries and the impact to recreational users such as bikers. So given these significant impacts, um, and the, we hope you know a little bit more about the scope of these projects and the magnitude of impacts that we'll be encountering if they are approved. I just want to give you a little overview of the timeline. So today, um, the most urgent timeline is the um, ERG's project will be going to the Planning Commission on um, March 13th next week. And when we say it will be reviewed by the Planning Commission, they'll be reviewing the draft envir or final environmental impact report um, and possibly taking a vote on the project. So it's, an, it's at 9 a.m. in Santa Maria, and there'll be a rally beforehand at 8.30. Um, so far, so that's the ERG project. Um, with ERA, we have, they've had a draft environmental impact report, and we are awaiting the final environmental impact report. Um, which could come out anytime in the next month or two, and then that will go to the County Planning Commission. As far as Petra Rock, um, they are still preparing that environmental impact report. So we're at the very beginning of environmental analysis for Petra Rock. So how can you take action? Um, it's a really important question. Um, as we mentioned, these three projects collectively will more than triple Santa Barbara County's oil production. So we're at a crossroads. This is a time where my children, my grandchildren, your children and grandchildren will be dealing with whatever decision we make for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Once these projects are approved, it's just an open door for more development. They're, they have lifetimes and spans that have no end date. So the impacts will continue um, and they, it's really easy for the oil companies to go in and expand once they have an existing project already. So different ways to get involved would be to attend the hearings, um, sign up to EDC, become a member so that you can be on our action alert list and receive talking points and updates about upcoming hearings and opportunities to get engaged and become involved. 
If there's any questions, I think we're going to open it up to some question and answer. If anyone has anything that they'd like to hear from us, we're, we're happy to give it our best shot. Yeah, thank you so much, Alicia and Tara. That was a great overview. Um, Tara, if you would join us again here. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in already. And as Alicia mentioned, if anyone has um, another question, you can ask it right now um, in the control panel. Um, you will see a little Q&A icon there, and you can just type it in. Um, and we'll do our best to answer them as they come in. Uh, the first one here is, what is the difference between fracking and acidizing? Well, I can start with that. And Alicia, feel free to jump in. Um, so as I mentioned during um, the beginning part of the presentation, uh, fracking and acidizing are, are different um, techniques. So with fracking, you are injecting um, fluids deep underground to then fracture the formation for oil production. Um, as compared to acidizing, you're putting these acids and um, chemical compositions de deep down underground. Um, the acid then enters into the formation and um, breaks down the formation. And there's, again, for oil production, um, acid maintenance, I, was, I described in um, the presentation is a little different. It just doesn't enter the formation, but just removes the scale um, off the well bore through the use of acids. Uh, so different processes and also with acidizing, there's different techniques that I mentioned. It's matrix acidization as well as acid fracturing. Great. Thank you. Um, where else have oil companies used cyclic steam injection and have there been any problems with them? Um, I can take this one. Um, cyclic steam injection um, has been used throughout California. Um, it's also been used up in Canada. Um, and it, it's not a brand new by any um, extraction method by any means. Um, as I think Tara mentioned earlier in her presentation, um, but it is the process after all the oils, the easy oils come out um, where it's used to go get sort of that bottom of the barrel, really thick oil. Um, in fact, the oil companies actually form new companies um, with a different set of investors that want to invest in much higher risk projects. Um, and that's, that's significant and alarming um, when you think about that the technique is high, such high, carries with it such high risk. And it's so different from con conventional oil that it actually requires a different set of investors that are willing to accommodate that high risk. Um, and this is from the significant amount of environmental impacts that we described today. Uh, but there have been significant problems. Um, Kern County's had a, a tremendous amount, um, as well as Monterey, of these cyclic steam injection types of um, oil operations. Great. Um... Someone here is curious, just why are there so many trucks on the roads? Why, why are these projects causing so many truck trips? Um, so I can respond to that. So yes, all, as I mentioned, all three um, collectively, these projects will add about 600 trucks each day to local roads, um, as well as more regional routes like the 101, um, Highway 106, et cetera. So, uh, Trucking is involved in construction and as well as for operations. And um, for construction, that would be bringing in different mater or materials and equipment, um, hazardous and non-hazardous materials, as well as drilling rigs um, and other type of equipment to, um, uh, to drill, which is through construction and into operations as well. Um, it's a form of operations, really, since these are projects to drill. So. Um, but trucking is, is a, a big component of, of construction. And then as you go into operations, there's also a large amount of trucks, um, hundreds of trucks, which are needed to import the light crude oil to blend with the crude that is brought up from um, Cat Canyon oil field. Um, and then once that's blended, that oil is then um, exported from the oil field to go into uh, different refineries. Um, or for AERS projects specifically, back all the way back to Bakersfield, um, where it's processed at their facility. So, um, as well as mat other materials and um, waste and other types of trucks that are needed throughout operations as well. So, collectively, um, 
the number of trucks for these projects is extremely high. And especially on local um, rural roadways, uh, accident rates is also um, very high for a tanker truck. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, the hearings and comments. Um, people are wondering if there will be any meetings to attend in Santa Barbara, and also if their comments need to be specific to the final EIR. Well, I can talk about that. That's a really good question. Um, the, the meeting, the upcoming meeting for ERG um, it does take place at the Planning Commission office in Santa Maria. However, you are able to testify remotely at the Santa Barbara County Administration Building as well. Um, so most of the hearings will usually give you an opportunity to testify remotely if you're, depending if you're in North or South County. Um, and then in terms of comments, the upcoming hearing for ERG um, will be assessing the environmental impact report um, as well as the project. It is possible that the commission can take a vote on the project on March 13th as well. Um, however, first, in order for the commission to do that, they first have to make an evaluation of the environmental impact report and the adequacy. And they would have, in order to approve the project, they would have to certify the EIR first, certifying that it is consistent with um, local and state laws such as the California Environmental Quality Act. And that's the threshold before they can actually move to approve or deny the project. And so that would, would be upcoming on March 13th. It's possible we may have additional hearings as well because it is a significant project and I expect the community and the decision makers will have a lot of questions. Great. Um, we have a question here regarding um, the last meeting in Santa Maria um, and that era said that they would not be using fresh water. Instead, they would be bringing in non-potable water and also that they would respect existing oak trees. And they're curious, um, I guess, on who regulates this and who checks in to ensure that they are doing what they say. Um. Sure, I can take this. In terms of enforcement and regulation, if a project is approved, um, it would be up to the county to, for, to enforce that all of the um, findings for approval and the project description and all the components of the project um, and the mitigation measures um, are, are being implemented. So the county would be the enforcement agency for that um, in terms of mitigation. For, um, I think, what was the... What was the first part of the question, Betsy? Um, I think you've you've answered it pretty. Okay. Well. okay. <laughs> how they're yeah, how they're enforced. I think I, I would just add that um, there is a lot of rhetoric out there that these projects aren't using fresh water, and that's for the steam generation. Um, however, we also identified you know issues with the wastewater disposal um, from the water used for steam generation, but. Um, separately, there is a substantial quantity of fresh water used for our, all three of these projects and especially together um, collectively. And that's for the different um, processes that I mentioned um, at the beginning of the, the presentation. But to name a few, um, for well drilling, for dust control, domestic uses, landscape irrigation, um, and a host of other um, uses that would require, again, very large amount of fresh water from the Santa Maria groundwater basin, which is also a source of drinking water for a lot of North County communities, as well as um, a big draw for um, agricultural operations. Great, thanks. We have a lot of interest here um, about how people can most effectively testify, especially as non-experts. Um, also, if they need to request time in advance to speak at these meetings, and if they can um, give their comments live from video in, in Santa Barbara, and also um, if EDC will be, how EDC will be communicating talking points and, and how um, people can comment, if they can get a little information on all that. Um, sure, I need to get started at that. Um, so in terms of how you testify, um, you would, you can testify in Santa Maria on March 13th. You show up, um, the hearing starts at nine. You would get a speaker slip there by the door and you would fill it out. Um, in terms of being a non-expert, 
95% of the community is a non-expert. The decision makers um, and the community, we all need to have a voice and we all need to speak up. Um, this, you're going to be the ones living with this. We are all going to be living with this, whatever decision we make. So it's important to let the decision makers and our representatives know if we want to make a choice for to triple oil production or do we want to actually make a choice for a clean energy future for Santa Barbara County. Um, you don't have to provide technical comments on the environmental impact report. Um, that will be something, a lot of those are legal and technical. Those will be something that um, EDC will be doing on behalf of our client, Sierra Club, Los Padres chapter. Um, but you can certainly appear, you can just state your opposition for the project. You can state a few concerns, concerns that you have with the project. And that will give the decision makers, um, you know, sometimes based on those comments, they'll ask for more information if everyone comes and talks about concerns on drinking water contamination. Um, and it just gives the decision makers an idea to hear from the community. So it's really important. You do not have to be an expert. We urge you, even if you get up and state what you're concerned about and where you stand on the future of clean energy in Santa Barbara, it's a very important point. And um, as I mentioned before, you can just, if you want to not go to Santa Maria and you want to go to Santa Barbara and testify remotely, um, you would just go to the hearing room um, we, uh, in Santa Barbara County in the administration building and it would be the same process. And they, it's, they have someone in there and you would fill out a speaker slip and then um, they have a video camera and you would, they would take care of that to actually um, transmit your testimony into the hearing. Thanks, Felicia. It's great. So many people are interested in attending. Um, we have a bunch of great questions coming in. I'll just get uh, to two more. And if we didn't get to yours, I apologize, but please feel free to email us with your question and we'll do our best to respond to you. Um, we have one listener here that's uh, wondering if there's a way to get access to the actual list of chemicals that are used by these oil companies, especially uh, when they're stating that they're under patent or trademark laws and, and cannot release the chemical composition? That is an excellent question. <laughs> um, in all of EDC's comments to date on these projects, we have specifically requested an inventory of the toxic and hazardous chemicals. Um, and so far that has not been disclosed. It is something that um, legally they are required to do um, so the decision makers can be aware of all the impacts um, that may occur on the site from using those chemicals. So that is critical information that must be disclosed during the environmental review process. And that is something, one of our most important issues that we are pushing for full disclosure. So stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have an inventory for you soon. All right, final question here. Um, if we can stop uh, the ERG project and get them to um, not certify the final EIR, how does this affect the other two projects? Um, that's a, another really great question. Um, you know, I think one of the things we've learned from dealing with these oil projects over the years, um, I'll say just harking back to Pacific Coast Energy Corporation's project, which was a cyclic steam project um, that was the first onshore oil, um, onshore oil project um, that EDC um, that has ever been defeated in the county. And that really opened the door for an in-depth investigation into these projects. So it's made the community, it's made the decision makers, and it's certainly um, forced us at EDC to take a really deep look into these projects and to ask the right questions. And what that results in is that um, through the environmental review process, there's a significant amount of information that's coming out now. Um, for example, just on freshwater use is an excellent example, um, something that's being uncovered. So if we are able, the more information we can get out of these projects and the impacts um, as they go through the process, it, it just makes it easier because um, these are such dirty, high risk projects. Um, so if we can, defeat the first project, it makes it much easier based on that same information and those same impacts um, to go through the second and third projects as well. Um, and a lot of these, once you know, once we actually have full disclosure on what's going on on the ground and the impacts, it's actually a pretty easy decision. 
in terms of what our choices are for our future in Santa Barbara. Great. Well, thank you, Alicia and Tara, so much for the great presentation. And thanks to everyone who spent their lunch hour with us today. Um, and again, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, please feel free to email those to us. Um, and also, we did record this today. So if you know other people who um, you would like to have this information, we will send out an email to you and you guys can definitely pass that along to others. So thank you so much.